Praise God. Good evening, church. Amen. Everybody's getting settled in. And uh, like I've said so many times before, because we're family, we're not supposed to be sitting there watching our watching the clocks and waiting for it. There, there should be life. There should be fellowship and conversation and activities going on. And uh, truth be told, I'm just trying to stall while Brother James turns the heat up because it's, it's chilly in here. Uh, 66, that's the temperature you turn it down before you go to bed. That's, that's not where you sit up and have church in. So I, I was tempted to grab a blanket and wrap it around me and just, uh, but that's all right. Praise God. Well, we got a we got a couple more trickling in. I want to give them an opportunity to to get in here, and I hope everybody's been staying safe so far in the weather. And I think uh, we should all be home safely tonight. I don't think the second round's supposed to come through until about ten ten thirty. So, Lord willing, we'll all be home. We'll all be in bed. We'll all be safe, and uh, we can pray for those that are traveling at ten ten thirty. All right, I guess we got everybody in here. If you've got your Bibles with you, uh, please join me in the book of Revelation, chapter 3. Revelation, chapter 3. And tonight, we are coming to the last church of the seven, and that is the church at Laodicea. So if you've got your Bibles open, chapter 3, verse 14, let's uh, read our text this evening. We'll have a quick word of prayer and then we'll begin our study. Verse 14, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I am, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we could gather together this evening and uh, as a family sit down and open your word and study it. And our desire, Father, this evening is to hear your voice and to discover your truth and to have it transform us. So, Father, speak to us this evening, I pray, and may your Holy Spirit be our teacher For your glory and for our good, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I guess if there was a a philosophy that the world tends to live by, I don't know if I could just sum it up in, in one statement, but it would certainly be something along the lines of you need to be able to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You need to look out for number one. You need to get yours before somebody else gets theirs. And for the world, it's all about self-strength, self-reliance, self-achievement. And I guess if I had to put it in two words, I would, I would have to say for the world, it's, it's largely about self-sufficiency. Everything they believe, everything they pursue has to do with self and their own accomplishments, their own abilities to achieve certain things. Now, this attitude, of course, is going to create apathy towards Christ's authority towards the Word of God, uh, most certainly towards any need for them to repent, any need for them to have faith or believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, because one of the things they also fail to see as a sinner is their own condition. Because of their belief of self-achievement and um, um, 
accomplishing their own uh, sufficiency, they fail to see that the scriptures clearly reveal that they have sin. It, they fail to see that they're in need of a savior. Therefore, they figure that they're able on their own to accomplish their own salvation. They fall into a deception of believing that they're right with God because they have a works religion. They do more good than they do bad. They uh, don't do certain things, but they make sure to do other things. We know that that self-righteousness is the exact opposite of everything the Bible teaches. That type of works righteousness is what Isaiah was referring to when it, he said that your righteousness is as filthy rags before God. We know that self-reliance is the opposite of true Christianity. The person that's come to faith in Jesus Christ by the grace and the mercy of God one of the first things they'll confess to you, is it not true, that without Christ I can do nothing. Jesus clearly said, apart from me you can do nothing. And the believer says, amen. But the sinner finds that offensive. The person that depends on self-righteousness and self-reliance, they don't care for that kind of talk because it removes their ability to accomplish their salvation on their own. And we see this over and over and over again in the scriptures. And as we come to the last letter this evening, we're going to see a church, and I use the term loosely because it's a church that's filled with unbelievers. It's a church that's filled with those that are striving for their own self-righteousness. They're striving for a works righteousness, a self-righteousness. And as a result, this is the only church, this is the only letter that receives no commendation, only rebuke. And as we go into the letter, one of the first things we see is where Jesus introduces himself. And remember, every time Jesus introduces himself to a church, he's doing so in such a way that speaks to the issues or the commendations the Lord is giving the church. It always connects his introduction with the church. And in verse 14, we see that he introduces himself to the angel of the church in Laodicea, First off, as the amen, the word means truth, affirmation, certainty. It's that which is firm, fixed, and unchangeable, which most certainly Jesus Christ is. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is unchangeable in his nature. He is fixed in his holiness and his faithfulness and his truthfulness. 2 Corinthians 1.20 tells us this. For as many as the promises of God are, in him they are yes. Therefore, through him also is our amen to the glory of God through us. The promises of God are yes and amen. They are firm. They are fixed. Through Christ, all of God's promises, all of God's covenants are fulfilled. They're all guaranteed. Christ fulfills every single one of them. And the ones that haven't been fulfilled will be when he comes and he returns for his church. Next, he introduces himself as the faithful and true witness. Only Jesus Christ is truly faithful. Oh, we strive to, I pray you strive to, we want to be faithful, but because of our nature, because of our uh, human nature, we, we fall short, don't we? We, we strive with everything we can to be, to be faithful to one another, to be faithful to commitments, to even be faithful to the Lord. But the Bible says that God remembers, thankfully, that we are made but of dust and we fall short. And sometimes it's things outside of our control that keeps us from being able to fulfill the promise we made or to, or to be faithful the way we want to, but not so with God. There's nothing out of his control. There's nothing that can stop him from fulfilling every promise he has ever made. Jesus Christ is also the perfect representation of the Father. When he was on earth and Philip said, Jesus, show us the Father and that will be sufficient. Jesus said, Philip, have I been with you so long that you don't know me? If you want to see the Father, just look at me. Because he was the exact representation of all that God is, all of his attributes, everything the Father was, Jesus Christ perfectly represented. He is the faithful and true witness to God. And next he says that he is the beginning of the creation of God. 
Now, many people mistakenly think this means that Jesus Christ was a created being. We've all heard the doctrine. We all know of the heresy that arises from this teaching. It most certainly is not teaching that Jesus Christ was a created being. But rather, what it is teaching is he is first in origin. He is first in authority. He is the cause, source, and power of creation. In other words, if Jesus doesn't begin creation as we know it, creation would not exist. For him to be the beginning of creation isn't pointing toward his creation because he's without beginning and without end, but rather he is the beginning of the authority of creation. In Colossians 1, 15 through 17, Paul puts it very clearly. Referring to Jesus, he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of of all creation. Now again, we have to be careful here not to believe this is teaching Jesus was created. And Paul goes on to explain, verse 16, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You see, loved ones, Jesus is the origin of creation. He is the authority over all things. He is the cause, the source, and the power of creation, without beginning and without end. So when we consider the letter to the Laodicean church, we see that the church is standing in opposition to everything Jesus Christ is standing in opposition to all of his attributes. They were not walking in the truth, as Jesus Christ is the truth. They were not walking in the truth of the gospel that they were called to walk in. They were not being faithful to their Lord. They were being the opposite of that. They were not being the witnesses of Jesus Christ to the world that we are called to be. How many of you know the Bible says that we are called to be the ambassadors of Christ? We're called to represent him. When the world looks at us, they see Jesus. They should see Jesus. That's the idea. They should see in us the living Savior. They should hear him speaking through us, acting through us. We are to be the representative of Christ as Christ is of the Father. But this church was failing in that area. And the introduction to this letter serves as a severe rebuke to this Laodicean church because they were none of the things that Jesus was and is. And then Jesus goes right into the rebuke in verses 15 and 16. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Something that will help us understand this would be just a, a little bit of history, a little bit of ge geographical context. Laodicea was located 10 miles west of Colossae, and the city of Colossae was known for its refreshing cold springs that would run down from the nearby mountains. They were very well known for nice, cool, cold drinks of water. And six miles north of Laodicea was Aeropolis, which was known for its hot springs. They basically, they had hot tubs all over the place. And you could get in one of them, and you could sit, and you could soak. And they was well, very well known for being therapeutic to sore bones and sore bodies. Well, Laodicea piped in water through aqueducts. And because of the long journey from Colossae and Heropolis, by the time the water reached Laodicea, it made it lukewarm. It became tepid. The two waters would eventually cool down on their own, and then when they would meet, it, it, it was really not very pleasant to drink. And somebody that would be visiting Laodicea that didn't know the situation with the water, if they went to take a drink of water, they would immediately spit it out. Because it was neither cold nor hot. It, it was rather disgusting to drink. What we need to ask, though, is, is what is meant here by lukewarm. He said the problem is you are lukewarm and that's why I will spit you out of my mouth. Well, one school of thought is that this is a rebuke to believers because they are 
spiritually apathetic or perhaps they're half-hearted in their worship. They don't have any prayer life. Uh, they're not serving as they should be serving. This is really an opportunity for a lot of ministers, a lot of teachers, to take this text and to use it, if you will, to sort of try to manipulate the congregation to act a particular way. To try to manipulate people with guilt to say, okay, well, you're acting lukewarm because you know, you're not raising your hands in worship or you're not reading your Bible an hour a night or you're not praying an hour a night so church we don't need to be lukewarm we need to get active about the things of God otherwise Jesus is going to be truly disgusted with us and spit us out of his mouth now there is something to say about becoming complacent spiritually we all know the dangers of that I believe if we were honest we will all admit that there's been times where we've done so where we did let our prayer life sort of fade away and, and it's not as intense as it ought to be there has been times where we don't read our Bibles as we ought to. We sort of backslide in that area. Now, let's, let's not anybody be a Pharisee in here. And let's just admit our humanity. And let's admit sometimes we do indeed fall back in these areas. But the problem with that particular belief is it doesn't fit the context of this passage. It doesn't fit that Jesus calls them uh, to faith in the letter, to calls them to a, a higher spiritual service, a higher standard of worship but rather the context doesn't allow for that but what it does allow for is that Jesus is actually calling them to salvation in this letter and the letter makes it abundantly clear if you notice in verse 18 and we'll, we'll get to it here in just a little bit he is encouraging them to uh, look to him for righteousness he is encouraging them to look to him for only what he can give to save their souls and he's encouraging them to get the gold that only he can offer and to clothe themselves in righteousness, clearly indicating that they didn't have any righteousness to speak of. So the best way to view this particular question of what does it mean to be lukewarm is that this church was filled with religious hypocrites. They were real good at, at talking. They were real good at performing, but there was no depth to their acts of worship, to their acts of service. They were spiritually dead. They were religious hypocrites much like the Pharisees were. They were not hot enough to display the transformed life that only the Holy Spirit can accomplish in you, and they were not cold enough to feel the sting of conviction. They were lukewarm, self-righteous, religious activists, just like the Pharisees were. If you was around a Pharisee, you, you would declare up and down they love God. You would, you, would, you would be convinced that with their knowledge of Scripture and all the things that they do and all of their righteous acts, man, they must be right with God. But those were the ones Jesus rebuked on a regular basis and said, you do not know the Father. But to the human eye, we wouldn't have known any better. This church was self-satisfied. They had come to trust their salvation instead of in the, the saving work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. They began to put their trust in, let's say, church attendance or, or all the good acts they do, feeding the poor or, you know, the list that you can fill in the blank. Usually you hear people say, well, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do this, or here's a popular one, well, I ain't killed nobody yet, that makes me a good person. Well, I only beat my spouse twice a year now. I used to do it four times. I'm getting better. I'm a good person. But we all know the truth, that we can't point to any of those things for our righteousness. But that's what this church was doing, and that's what the Pharisees were doing. Let me give you a perfect illustration of what was going on in this church. Turn with me to Luke 18. Put your finger in Revelation and turn back to Luke 18. This is such a fitting illustration. Luke 18, beginning at verse 9. I still hear, hear some pages turning. I want to make sure everybody's there. Luke 18, verse 9. And Jesus also told this parable to some people, now look at this, who trusted in themselves that they were righteous 
and viewed others with contempt. I mean, he gets right to the point, doesn't he? We're going to tell this parable for those of you that are trusting in yourselves for righteousness and you view others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. Here's the list of all of his accomplishments. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Turn back with me to Revelation. See, there's the picture right there. The Pharisee completely trusted in himself that he was righteous because of all the religious acts he performed. He fasts, he tithes, he does all these things. But Jesus said, he's not the one that's justified, is he? It was the sinner that confessed, I be merciful to me, I am a sinner. And the church at Laodicea was filled with this type of religious hypocrisy. In other words, like Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, 5, they held to a form of godliness, although they deny its power. I believe with all my heart, one of the reasons today that we see so much of this is because of the false gospel that's constantly being preached. There's just a false gospel out there today that does nothing but lead people astray and deceive them. It's the false gospel of health, wealth, and prosperity. It speaks nothing of sacrifice. It speaks nothing of repentance. It speaks nothing of the sinner being under God's wrath. All it talks about today is claim your miracle, claim your breakthrough, claim your blessing, God's only existence is for you to be blessed and for you to be happy. It, it has nothing to do with God's glory. It has nothing to do with Christ dying for sinners. They may give it lip service, but their heart is far from them. And as a result, we have so many people today, more than, more than I dare to even try to put a number on, that have fallen for this deception. And they believe because they walked up front or they signed the card or because they show up to the church or they put some money in the play, they've been deceived into believing they're born again and they're not. They're not. And Jesus is, is, is looking at this church and saying, you are, you're neither hot, you're neither really on fire for me, nor are you cold. You're, ne you're neither openly rejecting me. I wish you were one or the other, but because you're lukewarm, Jesus can't stand religiosity. He rebuked the Pharisees more than he did anybody else because of their false form of religion. He says, I will spew you out of my mouth. The literal translation is, I will vomit you out of my mouth. This must have been a severe, powerful, shocking rebuke to this church. Just as it was to the Pharisees when Jesus told them, you are of your father, the devil. They did not want to believe it, and they killed him as a result of it. But there's more rebuke in verse 17. He says, because you say, this is why I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. This is why I'm rebuking you. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. When I read this, the word deceived immediately comes to my mind. They were so wealthy, they, they considered God unnecessary. What do we need God for when we have everything we need? What do I need to depend on the Lord for when I'm so self-sufficient and I have so many things that, that I can draw from my own resources? What do I need God for? Which is exactly what they were saying. Because I'm so wealthy, I don't need anything. Jesus clearly said in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. You see, they were saying, Lord, Lord, but it was lip service only. There was no depth of, of love for Jesus Christ in their heart. There was no true salvation motivating their words, motivating their actions. Like the rich young ruler, they were deceived on their spiritual condition. You remember that story, don't you? The rich young ruler come to Jesus and said, Good master, tell me, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
You see, there it, again, there it is again. He wanted to do something. He felt like there's something I need to do. And Jesus said, well, you know the commandments. And he told him, you know, honor your mother and father and love your neighbor. And the commandments he gave him had to do with, with other people. And the rich young ruler looked at Jesus and go, I've kept all of them from my youth up. Well, number one, no, you haven't. Nobody's kept them perfectly. And then Jesus goes, okay, well, there's one thing you lack. You lack obedience to the very first commandment, which is you shall have no other gods before me. Go and sell everything you have, and then you'll be rich in heaven. But the rich young ruler walked away very sad because he had great riches. You see, he genuinely thought of himself as good. He never stopped to consider that he loved his money more than he loved God. And he was deceived about his spiritual condition. And the church at Laodicea is deceived about their spiritual condition. And look what Jesus says to them in the rest of verse 17. He says, you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. My goodness. My goodness, he is being very direct as he should be. He says, you don't even know. You've been deceived. You don't see your true condition that you may be materially wealthy, but you are spiritually bankrupt. You are poor. You are blind. You are naked spiritually before me. Now here's what's really fascinating. Jesus is speaking to the three main uh, if you will, commercial items that they use to attain their wealth. He's referring to finances, clothes, and ISAB. Again, a little bit more history on the city of Laodicea. They was located on a crossroad, which made their city absolutely ideal for trade and commercial business. They had so many people coming and going from north, south, east, and west. They was able to make a ton of money off of trade and commercial. They was able to sell everything as people was coming through, and, and they just made a ton of money. Two of the things they were most famous for was, number one, they had a soft black wool that, that nobody else had. It, it, it was uh, only in that area that they was able to uh, uh, achieve this soft black wool, and they used it for clothes mostly, but they also used it for carpet and other things like that. Their clothes were so soft because of this wool. And you can only imagine if you got two choices of something really coarse and itchy or soft and non-itchy, which one are you gonna want? Well, they had the soft non-itchy and that's what everybody was after. And they was able to make a lot of money off of that. But Jesus said, number one, you're poor, regardless of how much money you're making. Number two, you're naked. No matter what kind of special wool you have, it doesn't matter. Spiritually, you're naked. Thirdly, they had a medical school that was famous for an ISAB that they had developed. And people came from all over the region to get this ISAB to find some relief for whatever may have been ailing them. But notice Jesus says, you're blind. You're blind. Your ISAB does you no good. It does you no good because you're spiritually blind. He's attacking the very things that they were dependent upon for their righteousness. Now, you, wouldn't, now you would think, wouldn't you, that after Jesus said, basically, you're making me sick, that there wouldn't be any more talking. He, he would rebuke them. He would say, here's the problem. He would say, you're making me sick. And then you would think that would be the end of the discussion. Well, how many of you are, are glad to know personally tonight that God's love and grace is always available? Thankfully, I heard a bunch of amens on that one. Because if you're born again, we were no better off than Laodicea, were we? In our sin, we were no better off than Laodicea. We were just as blind, we were just as wretched, we were just as poor, we were just as miserable. But the love and the grace of God come to us. And now watch this, he's about to offer it to them. In verse 18, here is grace offered. He says, I advise to you, buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. 
So first he points out to them these material wealth that you have doesn't mean a single thing. You're spiritually poor. But if you want to be spiritually rich, I can give that to you. How many of you know Jesus Christ is the only true source for spiritual riches? It can come from nowhere else. He is the author. He is the perfecter of our faith. He is the one that gives us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And they can come from nowhere else. And Jesus said, if you want to be truly rich, stop trusting yourself, stop trusting your material riches, and turn to me. I will give you the spiritual riches that no one else can. I mean, really, loved ones, uh, how many of us know the truth that, that Bill Gates can have all the money in the world, but if he doesn't know Jesus Christ, he's poor. It means nothing. And you could be the poorest person in the land, but if you have Jesus Christ, you're infinitely richer than Bill Gates ever could be. Pick your billionaire. It doesn't matter who it is. Without Jesus, that money means nothing. It, it reminds me of the story of, of the richest man in, on the world, in the world died. And before he died, he took all of his uh, wealth and, and brought it all into one big bar of gold. He just, he just liquidated everything he had and made one big bar of gold because he wanted, he wanted to take it to heaven with him. Well, he died, and he gets to heaven, and he comes walking up to the pearly gates, and St. Peter's standing there. And uh, Peter goes, what you got there? He said, well, I got all my worldly riches right here in, in this big old piece of gold. And Peter kind of laughed and said, okay, go on in. And no quicker than he got in, an angel looked up and said, hey, look, we got more concrete. I like it. I like it. Next, Jesus says in verse 18, he says, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire. That is the, the pure, holy, spiritual riches that only Jesus can give so that you may become rich. And white garments so that you may clothe yourself. This is an offer for the church to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Over and over again in the Bible, and we're going to see it in the book of Revelation, where the saints in heaven are clothed in white. It's symbolic of the purity, the righteousness, the holiness that only Jesus Christ can give us. See, this is why we know this is a church that is filled with unbelieving uh, religious hypocrites because Jesus is offering them righteousness. He's telling them you need to be clothed in this righteousness, which is far better than the black wool that you have. The clothing that Jesus Christ is going to give covers them spiritually. And notice what he says. He says that if you get these white garments and they clothe themselves, that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. That is the shame of your sin before God. That is the shame of your depravity before God. And only Jesus Christ can clothe us in this righteousness. And at the end of verse 18, he says, And I salve to anoint your eyes that you may See, only Jesus Christ can give us spiritual eyes to see. The Bible says in Corinthians that the God of this world, lowercase g, Satan, has blinded the minds of those that do not believe, that they cannot see the glorious light of the gospel of Christ. You see, they're spiritually blind. Sometimes when I'm praying for the lost, I ask God to pierce the spiritual darkness they're living in and give them eyes to see Jesus. Give them eyes to see their need for a Savior because they're spiritually blind. Again, think back to before you were a Christian. Unless you were a Christian at such a young age, you can't remember back that far. But I can clearly remember being deceived. I can clearly remember thinking I was a good person. Anybody else in here used to think they were a good person? Yeah, a few hands went up. A couple other heads are nodding. That was the deception, wasn't it? We were spiritually blind. And Jesus is saying, figuratively speaking, the eye salve I'll give you, as impressive as yours is, it can't do anything like what mine can do. Only I can give you spiritual eyes to see. Christ alone offers righteousness, loved ones. We have nothing to offer but sin. You understand that, right? When it comes to salvation, we have nothing to offer but our sin. We have no good works to speak of. If there's even one good work you're still trying to hold on to, I encourage you to let it go, because it's not as good as you think it is. We have nothing to bring but our sin. 
And Jesus Christ offers to take it. And he offers to forgive us. And he offers to wash us clean, clothe us in white garments in his righteousness. Give us spiritual eyes to see. Because it's righteousness the sinner is missing. And it's righteousness the sinner needs to be able to stand before God. And the religious hypocrite is doubly deceived because they're convinced of their righteousness. They're convinced of their righteousness because of their religious acts. It's a double deception. And Jesus is giving them a very gracious offer. But they have to understand there's nothing we can bring but our sin. I love the call in Isaiah 55, 1 through 3, a, a call to the gospel. It says, you there, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Now, wait a second. How are you supposed to buy if you don't have money? That's an odd statement, isn't it? I mean, it almost seems cruel, doesn't it? Hey, those of you that are, that are thirsty and hungry, come on, buy something and eat. But I don't have any money. How am I supposed to do that? Because it's free. It's free. Come and buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy? Why are, why are you pursuing things that cannot fulfill you as God can? Why are, why are you pursuing things that, and spending your money on something that is not bread? It can't satisfy you. Only God can satisfy you. Only Jesus Christ can fulfill you. Wages for what does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. This is the plea Jesus is giving the church at Laodicea. And in verse 19, he gives further encouragement. He says this. He says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Now, we know that this is a truth that, that the Scripture speaks of consistently. For example, Proverbs 3, 12. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. Now, Christ certainly loves unbelievers. It says in Ezekiel, he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they would live. And in this particular case, his reproving and his correction is for them to repent. It's for them to turn to him in repentance and seek forgiveness and seek the righteousness that only he can give. It is further grace being offered to the church. And in verse 20, we see a promise. He says, Behold, who can remember the definition I gave you of behold at the very beginning of our study? 500 points for whoever can blurt it out and tell me the definition of behold that I gave you at the very beginning of the study. Nope. Close, though. Close. Okay, before anybody gets too far back in their notes, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. Uh, check this out. That's another way of defining behold. Check this out. Pay attention. Listen up. Because there's something, something major that's about to be said here. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Instead of judgment, Jesus is giving a gracious offer of salvation. Instead of judgment, he's given a gracious offer of salvation. Now, this particular passage, some people want to use it uh, for an evangelical application. And we've all heard it, and perhaps we've, we've used it. And I, I, I guess in, in some degree you could. Uh, the way it goes, basically, if you're evangelizing to somebody, they say, well, brother, Christ is standing at the, at the door of your heart, and he's knocking, and if you would just let him in then you would be saved. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 can, I can see that. Um, but, the, but the problem with that is the context doesn't allow that interpretation. The context, the context simply doesn't allow that. The door wasn't a single human heart that Jesus was referring to. The door was to the Laodicean church as a whole. Jesus wanted in the church, and there wasn't any believers in there for him to come in to. The, the phrase here at the end of verse 20, I will come into him and will dine with him and he 
with me. This is a picture of fellowship, of communion, of intimacy. Jesus is standing outside of the church, and he's, he's knocking, so to speak. And John MacArthur put it the best, I believe. He said, if one sinner would repent and turn in faith, then Jesus would have come into the church. I think we've all seen the picture of Jesus standing outside of a building. And this scripture is underneath the picture. And it says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. And it's a beautiful picture of Jesus standing outside the door. But what most people miss is that in this particular picture, the door that Jesus is standing in front of does not have a doorknob. doesn't have a doorknob. And you can pull it up. I'm sure you could Google it or pull that picture up, and you'll notice there's no doorknob because the idea is the one has to open it up from the inside to let him in. And if one sinner in this church would repent, if one would turn to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith, then he would automatically be brought into the church and he would dine with them in fellowship and commune. And there's an intimacy. Now in verse 21, he says, He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now this is a figurative expression stating an amazing truth. This is a figurative expression stating an amazing truth, that Jesus, just as Jesus Christ overcame sin and death to sit at the Father's right hand, one day believers in Christ will sit with Christ, figuratively speaking, on his throne, and we will reign with him. That is an, a tremendous thought. That is a tremendous thought if we ponder on it long enough. We are going to rule and reign with Christ, and the Bible is very clear about this. Look at uh, chapter 5, verse 10. We'll begin at verse 9. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. That's believers in Christ. That's you. That's me. And this is a reference to the millennial kingdom. Do me a favor and turn to chapter 20. And this is smack dab in the millennial kingdom. And we won't read it all. But in chapter 20, verse 6, it says, Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So the, the truth, the promise that Jesus is making here to the church is that all overcomers, which of course is all believers because all believers are true overcomers, are going to reign with Christ in the millennial kingdom. You say, well, Brother Scott, what part am I going to reign over? I don't know. I can't tell you that. Uh, personally, I'm hoping I get something like Montana or, or somewhere around in there because I love the country and I love the wide open space. But something tells me whatever God gives us, we're going to be perfectly fine with. And there's going to come that day where this promise comes true. And we are going to reign and rule with Christ. He's going to be the absolute authority, but he's going to delegate authority to believers. I can't tell you exactly how that's going to look like. But when we reach chapter 20 in our study, we'll talk about it a little bit more. The right to sit with Christ on his throne is but one of many promises we've seen so far for the church. Out of our study so far of the book of Revelation and the seven churches that we've studied, let me remind you of the promises that Christ has given to the church, to me and to you. First off, we have this promise that we are going to reign with Christ. Overcomers are also promised the privilege of eating from the tree of life. We have the promise that we will receive the crown of life. We have the promise of protection from the second death, a promise that we will get to eat the hidden manna, a promise of a white stone with a new name written on it, a promise of authority to rule the nations, a promise of the morning star that is Jesus himself, a promise to wear white garments symbolizing purity and holiness, a promise of the honor of having Christ confess our names before God the Father, a promise to be made a pillar 
in God's temple and, the, and to have the name of God, the new Jerusalem, and of Christ written on us. Loved ones, these are amazing promises that Christ has made the church. And in, in every church we've studied, up to this very last one, all of those promises are ours. Amazing promises. That's why the other week I read the old hymn, Standing on the Promises of God. Because that's what we're doing, isn't it? All of these one day are going to become a reality. They're going to become a reality, and these truths belong to us. Simply amazing. Well, loved ones, I believe if there's anything that the church needs to hear, in verse 22, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I believe, it, I believe that it should be, if you have fallen into the deception of a works righteousness, of a religious hypocrisy, by the grace of God, I pray you repent. By the grace of God, I pray that you come before the Lord and you, and you seek him for the spiritual riches that only he can give and the, and the righteousness only he can offer you and that we don't put our faith in ourselves. Loved ones, don't put your faith in yourself. Don't put your faith in what you do or what you don't do. Only put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in what he did upon the cross. Put your faith in his gospel and nowhere else. And in that, you'll find the spiritual riches. In that, you'll find true salvation. And in that, you'll have a church where Jesus Christ comes in and fellowships and communes and dines, and there's an intimacy with the Lord inside of the church. Well, this closes the second part to the outline. We've studied uh, the things which were. That was the vision of Christ in uh, the first uh, couple chapters. And now we've studied the things which are, which is the seven churches. Well, loved ones, next Wednesday we begin the study of the things which are to come. And we got a, we got a few minutes. Um, let me just wet your whistle, if you don't mind. Uh, because the way, I, the way I like to put it is we are almost at the top of the roller coaster, if you will, in our study on Revelation. And when you reach a certain point, here we go. And, and it is like this for the next 15 chapters. Uh, so let, let's just read just a little bit into chapter 4, because next week we're going into the very throne room of God. And in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, After these things, these things being the vision of Christ, the letter to the seven churches, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Now, which, which was the first voice that John had heard? Jesus, right? That was the first voice he heard. Well, Jesus is speaking to him again. And he says, Come up here, where? To the very throne room of God. And I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately. I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and upon the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne came flashes of lightnings and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. Oh, are, are you getting blown away yet? Have you noticed how often John says like? He's doing the best he can to describe what he's seeing, but he can't really put it into words. That's why he, keep going, that's why he keeps saying it's like an emerald. It, it's like a sea of glass. It, like, it's not exactly these things. He, he, he's drawing upon the only thing he knows to describe to us 2,000 years later what it is he's seen. Simply phenomenal. Well, uh, what, what on earth are these creatures with eyes all around them? What is going on here? What are these 24 thrones? Well, what is this all about? Well, I hope you're able to come back next Wednesday. 
because uh, Lord willing, I'll have some answers for you, and we'll begin our study on uh, chapter 4. So let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we do thank you for your grace. Lord, as we studied the, the church at Laodicea tonight, it just kept registering in my heart. That used to be us. We used to trust in our own righteousness. We used to trust in our own abilities and our own good works. But by your grace, you saved us. By your grace, you called us out of that darkness and into the marvelous kingdom of your light. So, Father, help us to truly uh, have compassion for the lost, to have empathy, to be able to state with the great evangelist, there I go, but for the grace of God. So, Lord, I pray for anybody that may be listening to this study and to these words, that if they are trusting in their own righteousness, Father, I pray you give them eyes to see. I pray, Father, that you pierce the spiritual darkness they're living in with the light of the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant them repentance. Show them their sin and show them their need for mercy. And Father, when we evangelize, may we be filled with compassion, filled with grace and mercy, never condemnation, knowing that we were once in their shoes and we have nothing to boast of save Jesus Christ. So Father, bring glory to your name. Take these truths, I pray, and transform us. And Lord, if you choose to tarry, then prepare our hearts for next Wednesday when you give us a uh, vision, you give us access into your very throne room in Revelation chapter 4. So Father, it's with great excitement that we come together again to study uh, this amazing chapter and to learn more of you, that we may love you more, that we may serve you better, that we may become more like your Son, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.